Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you on this beautiful afternoon, soon evening, on behalf of the Polish National Foundation and the Cambridge Innovation Centre, who have invited you to this remarkable place, the Warsaw Stock Exchange. Tonight, I hope we're going to experience some groundbreaking, mind-twisting uh, thoughts and inspirations, maybe. Um, you see, the thing is, I thought that who is going to be here tonight? with us, because one thing we have all in common here is that we are so interested in new technology. And what is new technology? New technology is hope. We all have hope here for the better future. And we all hope that new technology is the mean to get us to this point, to the better future. So firstly, I would uh, like you to make a huge applause for yourselves. Because this is amazing. By everything we are going to see tonight and hear tonight, we hope for the better future. So I hope you are going to experience some of the amazing atmosphere that goes well with the subject of startups and new innovations. For those of you who may not have heard of it, what is the Polish National Foundation's uh, program, the project 100 by 100? You see the cases that uh, a year ago we had an anniversary of uh, Poland regaining independence. So we are planning, we planned and we are doing this. We invited uh, 100 and we are inviting 100 of influential uh, guests from all over the world. Those are actors, athletes, intellectuals, businessmen, entrepreneurs and opinion leaders. By doing so, we are hoping that we can get the message to them and they can get this message further. And the message is that Poland is changing. Poland is changing for better, that we are an open culture, a free nation, and we have innovation potential. This is the message we want to get out there as far as we can. So, um, the same opinion, I think, we, um, uh, well, our Prime Minister, Mr. Mateusz Morawiecki, couldn't be um, uh, here tonight with uh, us, but uh, he sent a letter that I would like to read now in Polish. Szanowni Państwo, rozwój badań i innowacji to jeden z priorytetów naszego rządu. Już dziś Polska znajduje się w ścisłej czołówce krajów przyjaznych inwestycjom w prowadzeniu biznesu oraz startupów. Tworzenie nowej rzeczywistości gospodarczej to nie są dla nas puste słowa. Wsłuchaliśmy się w głos tego środowiska i wprowadziliśmy wiele korzystnych zmian dla biznesu, w szczególności dla małych i średnich przedsiębiorstw. Chcemy bowiem, by polska gospodarka była konkurencyjna w Europie. Chcemy wspierać działania twórcze i nowoczesne. Polacy nie, są, nie, Polacy nie boją się innowacyjności. Jestem przekonany, że nasi przedsiębiorcy są w stanie być liderami w tej dziedzinie na poziomie światowym. Niezbitym dowodem na potwierdzenie tych słów są sukcesy startupów, które zostaną dzisiaj zaprezentowane przez ich przedstawicieli. Pełne wykorzystanie potencjału polskiej myśli naukowej i technologicznej wymaga jednak sprawnej i dobrze skoordynowanej polityki promocyjnej. Dziękuję zatem Polskiej Fundacji Narodowej za organizację dzisiejszego spotkania, będącego kolejną odsłoną ambitnego projektu 100 na 100 projektu, który przyczynia się do budowania wizerunku Polski jako kraju nowoczesnego i kreatywnego. Chcę także podziękować gościowi specjalnemu, Timowi Rułowi, za chęć poznania Polski oraz za dołączenie do znamienitego grona, grona ambasadorów polskiej marki na całym świecie. Głęboko wierzę, że Pana bogate doświadczenie we współpracy ze startupami przyczyni się do tworzenia nowych, ulepszonych wizji rozwoju, które stanowić będą inspiracje dla polskich przedsiębiorstw i badaczy. Szanowni Państwo, jestem przekonany, że dzisiejsze spotkanie stanie się płaszczyzną do zacieśniania współpracy na rzecz rozwoju polskiej gospodarki. Bo gospodarki. Życzę Państwu wielkiej pomyślności w realizacji ambitnych planów i zamierzeń oraz wykorzystania szans, które niesie nam przyszłość. Wszystkim zgromadzonym na dzisiejszym wydarzeniu przekazuję wyrazy uznania i serdeczne pozdrowienia. Mateusz Morawiecki. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, Tim Rowe. This is our main guest for tonight and will be join, joining us later on. Mr. Tim Rowe, who is uh, famous for bringing up innovation together to one place. And this is the lesson from tonight. I hope we all may like have a takeaway back 
So basically, the thing I personally hope, as I spoke about, about hope, I hope that tonight we will leave with a bag full of inspirations from Mr. Tim Rowe and from our startups who will be joining us in a moment. Inspirations about how to create innovations and how to create a space, a physical space for innovations. Ladies and gentlemen, without the further ado, let us the pitch session of startups begin. So, our first startup from our shortlist for tonight is Syntoil. They introduce themselves with a the claim our systems transform rubber waste into valuable commercial products. So let's hear it more from Martina Staba, this startup CEO. Martina, please join us. Hi. How are you doing? The floor is yours. Sure. Uh, do you hear me? All right. Hi. Good evening. Nice to see all of you. All right, so let's start. Many people think that you can see the Great Wall of China from space. You can't. But what you can see is this, a graveyard. A graveyard of used tires in Kuwait. Each year, we throw away more than one billion used tires globally. Many are buried, most are burned. It's ridiculous especially that we could reuse and recycle almost 100% of them. Respiratory diseases, water acidification killing fishes, and climate change. Burning tires contributes to all of that. We don't believe in burning. At Centoil, we transform used tires and products from used tires in a sustainable way into valuable resource. This resource is called a recovered carbon black. We work in a circular economy, which means that this product, recovered carbon black, can come back again into rubber production, into tires, into new tires, into a different rubber products like shoe soles, rubber hoses, mobile phone cases, you name it. There are a lot of them. We created this technology and patented that. Our impact is huge. Now we are building an industrial line which will help us to clean products from 2 million used tires annually. And our un environmental impact is also uh, very significant because this will help us to reduce 30,000 tons of CO2 annually. And it's like taking off the road 6,000 cars for one year. Climate change is not a bedtime story. It's already here, and it's terrifying. We are a part of the solution to fight it. Thank you. Hello again. Great job. Thank you. So, hmm. The first question I would like to ask you, mm. if I may. Why did you enter the sustain sustainability directly into your business model? Is it so important to develop um, on the basis of values? This is important for question for me. Because the important values you incorporated to this business model. Why? Yeah. So um, when we think about our business, when we think about the business world today, we see that there is only one uh, solution. There's only one way. Like we are dividing our business into two columns, into two parts: 50% of business and 50% of environmental impact and sustainability. We think that it's impossible in 21st century to create a business which won't have, which won't share those values. So uh, it was our first choice. Like we, uh, we are kind of, well, we are very transparent, and sustainability is a priority for us from the day one. And how's, how just exactly is this market how big? How big is this market? Oh, um, all right, so this black 
simple black powder, um, which I'm telling the whole world about, is called a carbon black. And carbon black is today, in a traditional way, obtained in a process of burning fossil fuels. People are just burning crude oil to obtain the carbon black. We are doing something called recovered carbon black. So it's the same, let's say, the same black powder, but just um, obtained in a sustainable way. So the market for this carbon black is enormously because uh, is an enormously big uh, because annually we are using 14 million tons of carbon black and it's the market worth like 14 billion dollars and it's growing like crazy because the passenger car production is growing also like crazy, especially in China. Uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, the China. Uh, um, China started to produce passenger cars in like just 20 years ago and now they're at the level of Europe and states and uh, this is the moment when they will just skyrocket so um, this market will grow very very fast yeah the market is enormous and you're solving a problem because this is one thing that uh, I think every startup who wants to be a business a full-time business must must ask themselves to be successful, is what problems do I solve? Because business, yep. businesses solve problems. That is was what business is all about. So, um, what sort of impact you think you can have with your solution on everything? All right, so uh, there are a few. One is the environmental impact, uh, because we are reducing the CO2 in a comparison to traditional methods of obtaining carbon black. That's the first thing. The second is that uh, we also show uh, the good example to the other business, uh, businesses and startups um, which can follow this path. Because we are a proof that it's possible to have both. And, or in fact, I should say, it's possible to have everything, to, um, to create a business, to earn money on it, and still be sustainable. So, um, yeah, so our impact, I would say, would be in those two areas. And the direct recipients of your solution, clients? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, our first market are rubber producers. Um, they are now today, they are buying uh, carbon black, uh, obtained in a traditional way. But it would, uh, it would be really great for them if they could find a replacement, a sustainable replacement for their carbon black. So uh, rubber producers are our first market. Uh, second, I would say uh, tire producers. And the third one, which is also very interesting, is something beside the rubber production, which is, uh, well, it can be uh, a pigment in the different paints or um, in printing toners. So, yeah, those would be our three biggest markets. Paint it in black carbon. Sounds good. Mm. Uh, competition. Do you oh. have competition? And if so, what advantages do you have? Yeah, so um, there are around 10, 13 teams around the world who are, which are trying to solve exactly the same problem. Um, well, the good thing is that, that we know all of them. We've just met them uh, in Berlin a few months, a few weeks ago. There was the Recovered Carbon Black Congress. It's a niche. There was like 200 people who were focused only on that. So you can imagine. Uh, so um, we know all of them and we could check our results with uh, them and for example our product is 53 times purer than our biggest competitor. Cool. So this advantage is like I would say that uh, the cleanliness of um, the, the purity of our um, of our material of our product would be our biggest advantage and also of course well, our, um, our, our process is quite efficient. Right. Good for you. Yep. Bravo. You. Okay, let's hear it for Martina and yep. Sitoil. Thank you. So. Well done. Ladies and gentlemen, our second startup tonight is Screwer, introducing themselves with the claim push the limits of 3D printing effortlessly, but there is much more to this with strong accents on STEAM education, because their business is education. With no further ado, let's hear it from Mateusz Rybinski, Chief Revenue Officer from Screwer.
Hello there. Hello. Make a good show. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, so I would like to introduce you Screwer, and uh, I would like to start with uh, our story to emphasize the importance of uh, learning process and the f flexibility. Uh, so we started as a manufacturer of the 3D printers around five years ago with the idea to make it as easy as possible and uh, with the idea to have 3D printer in every household. And we have created uh, very good machines, but uh, we failed because we target the wrong market. But then we realized that we can do something much more impactful, and then we started focusing on education. So uh, if you think about education uh, right now, and if you compare how we've been taught 50, 40, 30 years ago, there is no big change. Uh, the way is the same, but the world has changed, and uh, also the uh, technology is growing uh, very fast. So there is a big gap between what we should uh, know as a graduate student and what we actually know after the studies. Um, so we wanted to jump into this bandwagon and uh, started making something uh, which can help to solve this problem. And we created the ecosystem which uh, combines uh, 3D printing and the robotics. So uh, our 3D printers with the library of 50,000 models uh, right now can help uh, teachers on every subject. So imagine you are a biology teacher and uh, tomorrow you have to conduct the class about the brain. And uh, you can print the brain, as you can see the example there, Instead of uh, just, uh, just showing it from the picture, you can actually uh, show it to the students. They can use more senses. What's more, uh, we have created the curriculum uh, project based, uh, based on the STEAM methodology, uh, which helped them to, uh, to, s to get the problem solving approach. Uh, we have also created the uh, robotic uh, system. It's uh, kind of Lego-like, uh, which you can start building it. And with our curriculum, you learn the uh, programming and engineering and other STEAM-related skills. But it looks like a computer game with the narrative scenario. So uh, basically, the learning process is the side effect of a uh, fun for students. And uh, when you finish uh, those projects, you can start using our creator. Uh, which is the platform online where you can design uh, whatever you want. It can be drawn, it can be uh, another robot manufacturer. Uh, we just want to generate the uh, new creators. And right now we are focusing on, on uh, more curriculum to help on every subject, as well as uh, new products like drones or sm uh, smart city sets. And uh, finally, the second approach was, uh, is very successful. In two years, we entered 25 countries. We are in over 100 schools around the world. And uh, we are targeting much more. And if you have any questions, you can find me here or in the internet. Thank you very much. It was a great presentation. Personally, uh, it was a very short time you had. Uh, I'm stepping a bit out of my line uh, right now, but I'm a huge fan of uh, your solution because you're teaching kids basically things that will be mostly important in the nearest future. So if you could say a little bit more about the STEAM approach. Yeah, so uh, STEAM is an acronym uh, for uh, science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. And basically, it's an approach when uh, you should teach project-based, and if you show uh, one particular concept, you should show it from different perspectives, like uh, art, mathematics, uh, I don't know, science, uh, biology. Uh, so you don't see the thing from just one perspective, but you have a uh, big picture.
the huge integrated approach, right? Yes. Including mathematics, physics, yeah. and robotics. Exactly. So basically what you it. do is learning kids also the, um, the competences of programming, also the competences of robotics, and uh, while doing that, they have fun. Yes, that's the most important, to keep their attention. Right now we have many distractions from uh, mobile devices all around, so it's very important to keep the attention of uh, kids and students. That is amazing. But the question is, you're doing business on a very difficult uh, field. Uh, and famous is uh, the difficulty of doing business with the educational sector. How do you manage that? Yeah, uh, so currently all around the world, all the governments see the problem and also parents see that this problem exists and uh, the changes uh, have, have to come. So uh, there are more budgets for that. And what is more important, we, our uh, ecosystem is quite complex. So the return of investment, uh, if they would like to implement it in, in their schools, is, is very high because they can use it in every subject. Right. And how do you do sustain the international scaling? Mm -hmm. uh, so we believe in uh, localization and also uh, strong local partnerships. So we grow uh, globally uh, by strong educational partners which are in the educational sector for a long time. They know uh, governments, they know uh, people who are responsible for the purchases and they also help us to localize the product to the needs of the, uh, the, the cur cur curriculum in, the, in that countries. Right. Your plans for the future? Where is Screeware going? Yeah, uh, the one thing is we would like to, uh, to grow our own products and curriculum, but we are also would like to be a platform for uh, talented educators, which I found on every uh, conference around the world. Uh, we want to be a platform where they can uh, build the communities and they uh, can share their ideas with, with other educators. Okay. Well done. Good luck. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for the session. Our next startup is Flytech UAV, the people who want to conquer the skies. Let's hear a huge welcome for Radek Zich, sales manager from Flytech. That's a hell of a gadget. I Good luck, man. I don't need a presentation. <laughs> Good luck. Hello. It's great to be here. Uh, personally, I prefer the movies instead of presentations. So let's see uh, the short movie about the product we are doing. And during the movie, I will try to answer a few questions uh, about the, the product we have. So enjoy. Who we are, the first question. We are the company based in Krakow quite small one, because it's just 15 uh, of us, mostly engineers and fly engineers and uh, aircraft pilots. Uh, we are quite new company, but not startup in a technical way, because we are four years old company, and we already have some successes in, in Poland and also abroad. So the first question was who we are. The second question is what we do. We do, as you can see, drones, but not drones in the meaning that most of people are thinking of, so not the, can I use the company name? DJI, this is the most popular company in the world during uh, which do, do, do drones. We do something different, which is also called drone, because as you can see on the movie and over here, this is not regular multi-rotor with four uh, propellers and camera to make videos and pictures. We do drones for the special applications, for engineers, for surveying, for forestry, for agriculture, for archaeologists, and many, many other engineer uh, uses. So this is not 
most important thing, what we do. So the, the hardware, what you can see, it of course looks nice. Everybody likes something what can fly. And yeah, it obviously can fly. But most important thing is what we can put inside. So the sensor. And we are using the, for example, full frame camera with RGB. So exactly the same what you have in a pocket, maybe not full frame, but, but camera, it's an RGB camera. But we can use also the, for example, multispectral camera. If you heard something about multispectral, anybody here? Multispectral means that you can see how uh, forest or field growth. Is it okay or is it sick? Or you, you, can, you have to put more water to, to grow the, the, the fields? Uh, we can put inside also the thermal camera. For example, for the looking for people. One of our customers in Georgia is a search and rescue. So they are looking for the humans, lost people uh, in mountains with uh, our fixed wing. The difference between our plane and the, the multi-rotors is mostly the time we can spend in the air. We can fly for one hour, and on the last, we can prepare the 3D models and you can saw on a movie. So we are doing the pictures, and later, after, in, during the post-processing, we can create the 3D model, for example, of the city. And that's it, thank you. This is our product. Nicely done. I think you, I may have called you a man with um, proper attitude. You yeah. have the bigger picture because of it, maybe, possibly. So, how do you see the future of the drone industry? Okay, it's a nice question. I have two answers, but I will use only one. <laughs> uh, I like to say about the drones and the future of drones in general, not only about our company, but in general. Uh, comparing this to the mobile phones. Who of you had a Nokia 3120? It was 18 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> quite a lot. It was my first mobile phone. And it was used what for? Calling, messaging, and the third thing? Snake, Snake exactly. <laughs> yeah. I was using Snake because calling was too, more <laughs> too expensive. So, yeah, Snake, Snake was, was the, the main uh, usage of, of that phone. And now, after, let's say, 18, 15 to 18 years ago, what you are using phone for? For everything. You have a camera, you have a mobile office, you have a Excel, Word, uh, emails, everything. So, from my point of view, drones are in the same stage as Nokia was those 18 years ago. So, drones, most people think that drones are for making videos and pictures. And this is only the top of the huge mountain. This is, this is something what is starting. This is something what will change a lot in the next two or three years. So, for example, we, can, we started this in Poland. Uh, move the body parts and blood via drones from the hospital to the, another hospital. Uh, we, can, we will, and this is not the science fiction, we will. This is, more science than fiction. We will buy and order pizza and shoes and other things, and it will be delivered via drones. And this is, this is the future of that product. So long story short, sky is the limit. Yeah, it is. Okay, so if so, you have to have a plan for your company. Where do you see your company in this widely um, potential future? Yeah. Uh, obviously, we want to be the competitor for the DJI. It cannot happen. The market can be split it, and we like to split it in uh, three different areas. First area, the biggest, of course, is uh, civilian users for the like mobile phones. So people won't take the cameras with, for the vacations. They will take drones in a pocket and make the videos and pictures of the day holidays from, from the sky. And this is one huge area, and this is not, 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 nothing for us. From the other side, we have a military usage. So, the very, very expensive drones, uh, 
you heard probably just few week, last week, Iran uh, shot down the American drone. So this is also not, not us. We have a place for us, we found a place for us, only with the engineering solutions. And I hope it is growing in Poland, but we also have few distributors and few delivers in, in the Europe, or also in Africa and Iceland, for example. So you think the sky is not so crowded yet? Yeah, it is. It isn't. It yeah, isn't. exactly. This is, we have more uh, customers than comp the whole companies, the, our competitors can deliver solution. So we, we also, uh, our customers teach us what we should do, how we can improve our product or change it a little bit to fulfill what they require and wants. So I wouldn't say that the, the sky is crowded with drones for now, uh, but we'll try to do our best uh, to make it a little bit change. The first ones will make it. Okay, so let's hear it for Radek Zich and Flytech. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, man. Our next startup is Trigo. We've heard a lot about uh, Polish big plans for electromobility. It seems it's not so easy as it seemed, but I think that with solutions like that, maybe we can still make it. Maybe there is hope. So please join us, Mr. Rafał Budweil, the creator and founder of Trigo. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Boys and girls, uh, welcome. I came here to tell you about the project which I, which I love and I'm very proud of. And I sincerely hope that I will give you all the reasons to love it as well and to be proud of it as much as, as, much as I am. Now, uh, before I get to the point, uh, I will ask you a couple of questions. Uh, did you realize that most of us spent as much as 10 days, 10 24-hour days each year in traffic. 10 days. If you sum it up, it's two and a half years during our lifetime. Now, do you love it? Hands up, who loves getting stuck in traffic jams? Yes, there's always one. There's, <laughs> there's sometimes two. Okay, I, can, I can't help you then. Sorry. Uh, did you know that as many as 30% of cars in the urban traffic are cars in search for a parking slot. Well, that's what it is. During rush hour, 30% of cars circulating around the city are looking for parking slot, which means a lack of parking slot, slots increases traffic jams. Uh, who loves hunting for parking slots? Not even you, nor you. You do. Okay, fine. We have one. I can't help you. Now, uh, for the rest of you, uh, I would like to show you a short clip. The footage for that clip was taken uh, a couple of weeks ago during the road tests of uh, our latest prototype, Trigo. We call it PB3. Uh, that happened uh, on a racetrack near Warsaw, near Łódź. And Trigo does something very particular which you might have spotted a second ago. That's how it drives. That's our little elk test. And we are road legal for test purposes already. Now, I told you that uh, I would give you something that helps overcoming traffic jams and lack of parking which is what you just have seen. Trigo uh, does that because Trigo has a little trick. And uh, it's not about uh, the drive that is electric. Well, it is electric. It's 21st century. It's a, an urban car, so it has to be electric. Uh, but it's more than that. Trigo has two operational modes. One of them is high-speed cruising mode, which you see behind me. Uh, in that configuration, we go up to 90 kilometers per hour, which is 50-something miles per hour. Uh, 
Obviously, Trigo has enclosed cabin, uh, which separates you from rain uh, and too much sun. It also has uh, uh, seat belts. It might have uh, the airbag. Uh, so it gives you safety and comfort of a typical car, uh, while at the same time being able to uh, cross the traffic. And why is it so? Well, that's the second operational mode, the maneuvering mode. Uh, in that configuration, Trigo retracts the gear, and it gets as narrow as many motorcycles, and actually it is more narrow than many motorcycles available on the market. In those speeds, we uh, cross the traffic. In those speeds, we do parking. Uh, in this configuration, Trigo is 22 centimeters more narrow than my own motorcycle, which happens to be crossing the traffic fairly uh, efficiently. Now, as I mentioned, we do this, and this saves you 108, uh, 105 hours a year. And we can also do that, which is further 65 hours of your lo lost time. Now, more or less at this stage of presentation, there is um, a question about What's the price? Can I have one? Of course you can. And the price is 20 euro cents per kilometer. <laughs> because we are not willing to uh, compete with the, the biggest and the, and the most uh, powerful organizations of uh, uh, contemporary business. Uh, we are willing to uh, commercialize Trigo through two things. First of them is car sharing. Car sharing, we all know that these are the panic cars which we see all over Warsaw and five other different car sharing companies in Warsaw alone, which is a small brisk of what is happening everywhere else in the world. We are going at the huge pace towards sharing economy, towards mobility as a service. Owning a car doesn't make too much sense anymore. But there is stage two, and that is robotaxi. Whenever you hear robotaxi, you understand its future, and you understand it huge business, in fact. Robotaxi is uh, a combination of high unit revenues, typical for taxi services like Uber, with high margins, which are not known to Uber, but are very well known to car sharing companies. Now, uh, you might have spotted our logo, which obviously is inspired by the chessboard that was missing from the Spitfires and the Hurricanes of our, of our pilots during the Battle of Britain. Well, we used that as a very positive and strictly Polish symbol uh, because we wanted Trigo to be associated with Poland. And that happened six years ago. Right? Uh, we are a Polish invention. We have strictly Polish capital. We intend to manufacture Trigo in Poland. And we have uh, good reasons to believe that we are going to become a Polish global brand. Why? Because we have patents. Uh, we have managed to obtain patent protection for Trigo uh, in countries of a total population of 4 billion people, including the big ones like the US, uh, obviously not so useful in the US with their large streets and uh, uh, general amount of space, but everywhere else, including Southeast Asia, Definitely, yes. Our patent protection uh, extends towards uh, 2037, with the new, newest patents we have just been uh, granted. Uh, but we are obviously looking forward and doing our best to ex extend this uh, global patent protection even further. Now, um, a couple of words about the team. As you see, I'm uh, a little bit older than the average of the of my colleagues uh, presenting before uh, before me, and indeed we are a couple of a couple of old wolves uh, with uh, accumulated 79 years of managerial uh, experience, and we are about 20 young wolves who are our engineers, our constructors, our designers. Thank you. Show. Thanks. I would love to see your solutions on the streets of uh, Warsaw. Well, I, I, actually, you may have seen it already because we uh, carry the tests, which are also 
uh, carried out here in Warsaw, on the streets. All right. And uh, you said that uh, you are 24 wolves. Yeah. yeah, yeah, old ones and young ones. That's a good solution because the best businesses are made for, with people, uh, by people with experience. Uh, nonetheless, uh, there is a question that has to be asked: that what is your production capacity in a year period? The production capacity that we are going to develop uh, will strictly depend on the demand that we are going to uh, we are going to see. Uh, as I mentioned and emphasized during the presentation, uh, the biggest uh, asset that we have are patents. And we do our best to reinforce uh, the protection as, uh, far as, we, as far as we can. And that is the key thing. Uh, as far as manufacturing capabilities, well, you know, uh, we are nearing the point where we will have enough documentation to put it all in a huge zip file and send it to China and then wait for the containers. But this is not our intention. Our intention is to build uh, our own manufacturing capa capacity here in Poland, and there are some serious reasons to believe that it is possible. All right. Also because we did manage to secure quite a lot of uh, private and public uh, funding, and we used it all to get to the stage where we are in right now. If one is curious how it rides, how it goes, uh, where can we test it? Fantastic, <laughs> I can assure you. Uh, most important thing, everyone who drives a car is able, by definition, to drive Trigo. That is our ambition and the most important thing. If you have a B, B driver's license, you drive a car, automatic, then you know how to drive Trigo. As far as the sen sensations and user experience, uh, it m you might have spotted in the, in the clip that Trigo leans in curves which is probably the best thing in oh, motorcycling. I will try to test that, yes. Yeah. Uh, however, you do not ha need to have any additional special skill like a motorcyclist has to. Uh, it's all taken care of by the computer, one of three computers we have on board. Sounds fantastic. I'm a huge fan of yours from Thanks today. Enough. Thank you very much. Good show. When we began, I told you that uh, I really cherish the fact that uh, I believe we all have hope for the better future. So basically, which leads to the uh, thought that maybe a lot of us here are dreaming uh, about uh, star exploration, the cosmos exploration. Because the ability to discover something new to reach for the, for the stars, I think, I believe, is the most important and the best human threat there is. So, right now we're gonna reach for the stars. Star Revolution, come on on stage, please. Mr. Grzegorz Zwoliński. Let's hear a warm welcome. Thank you. The floor is yours. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so, my name is Grzegorz Zwoliński. I'm not the first time here. Uh, I'm, I have experience more than 15 years with uh, creating companies. Uh, I have two companies which making mobile games. They are on Polish stock market, uh, so you can check it. But uh, right now I, uh, I want to tell more about uh, my dream and uh, what, I, what I am up to right now. Uh, so. My company, Sartre Revolution, uh, I started like uh, three years ago uh, with my friends, uh, with, uh, uh, with the dream that we want to conquer uh, the space, because sky is not a limit. Uh, uh, we decided to, to create a company which is making, uh, um, which is designing, creating, and, uh, and, punct uh, and, uh, and lift the uh, satellite on the orbit. Uh, so, as you can see, there is a picture uh, showing that uh, our first uh, three satellite was uh, launched uh, uh, in the 17th of April on the International Space Station. Um, we are based in Wrocław, but let's, uh, let's talk more about uh, what we are up to. Uh, so, we want to create the biggest uh, Earth observation constellation in the world. Uh, so uh, we're aiming to create more than 1,000 satellites 
uh, with really huge uh, uh, resolution. This is 50 centimeter per pixel. Uh, so uh, for normally uh, most companies uh, have problems with achieving the, that kind of uh, resolution. We have uh, idea uh, to co compete with them in this uh, in this case. On on this photo, you can see how our co uh, infrastructure will look uh, all around the world. Uh, so we want to uh, we want to make photos every uh, 30 minutes of every spot on the uh, of the earth. So, uh, what is uh, our main challenge, uh, our main advantage uh, of our competitors right now? Mm, so, they have problems with, uh, this is not a problem, they're creating really big satellites. But right now, as you can see, we can uh, um, create a really small satellite which can uh, uh, do the same uh, photos as, as this big one. Uh, and with this huge uh, amount of uh, satellite, uh, our uh, constellation make, uh, uh, can create uh, non-stop uh, services for, uh, for our uh, planet. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is our goal. And uh, as you can see, th there is a lot of uh, different uh, uh, usage, uh, for example, Insurance. Uh, there is uh, mm, problems with uh, disasters. Uh, we can uh, see, estimate uh, what happened in real time. So this is a huge market. Uh, uh, there is uh, also uh, pro uh, precision farming um, and uh, smart city cases. There is. Uh, uh, in every spot of our life, we, can, uh, we have uh, we using uh, satellite data. We don't even know it. For example, uh, telephones or uh, uh, even bankomats. So, uh, and also, there is a really huge market for uh, for military usage of, uh, sure. of uh, those, ki those kind of photos. So this is uh, half uh, of the whole market uh, uh, we're speaking about. This is uh, right now uh, eight billion uh, dollars is strictly in, in making photos, but uh, there is also uh, a lot of um, uh, a lot of new money uh, involved in, in this uh, in this area. Uh, so um, our plan is uh, to put in uh, the next uh, two years uh, 16 satellites and after this 66 and uh, uh, up to uh, 2026 we want to have uh, more than 1,000 satellites on the lower orbit, 350 kilometers and uh, um, observe uh, all Earth uh, in one time. So this is... This is it. That was really inspiring. Thank you. Don't just space out yet. Um, I have a okay. few, few questions for you. So basically, you're telling me that uh, you are planning to put 1,000 satellites in orbit in the nearest future. How do you plan to do that? Uh, so basically, uh, we want, uh, we're buying uh, rockets. Uh, we're speaking with varieties of uh, launchers uh, and uh, mm, and just leave it to the, to the space, just like we did uh, with our first two satellites. Uh, right now, we have uh, two on uh, on International Space Station. In the uh, in the third of uh, uh, next month, we, uh, our satellite will be uh, flying in space. So I will do this uh, the same uh, for our whole constellation. If I get this right, the whole idea um, is that you don't have to have or own uh, a big satellite. You can have several smaller ones, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, mm, 
Uh, the big satellite, for example, as uh, Airbus have right now, uh, it costs 325 million dollars per each, uh, plus the launch and all the other costs. Uh, our satellite, uh, uh, in a, we estimate uh, in, in production it will be uh, 250,000 zloty uh, plus uh, lift, but this is uh, uh, we have to spend. So. Okay, so. Mm. You're planning to obtain, uh, to raise a funding of 4 million zlotys uh, to spend on the REC project, the real-time Earth observation const constellation, right? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, so right now we put uh, our uh, pathfinder of our constellation and uh, we uh, enter to the next step. Uh, we want to put a uh, bigger satellite, uh, the 6U satellite, uh, which can do 50 centimeter photo. And uh, right now we're raising, uh, on the crowdfund uh, platform, we're raising uh, 4 million zloty. So I want invite you, all of you, to uh, enter our website and uh, check out what is going on. Right. The presentation was spacey, the idea is spacey, so for the end of this uh, presentation just make it a huge punch for the fact that you, your name is Set Revolution. What is the revolution again here? So uh, the revolution is that we can uh, see every, uh, everything on the Earth uh, in the, every 30 minutes. So this is real time uh, seeing every spot on the earth so we can uh, help uh, people which have problems we can solve uh, a lot of environmental problems so this is uh, this is our revolution all right thank you very much ladies and gentlemen let's much. hear from Grzegorz Zwolinski balls in space congrats okay ladies and gentlemen now our second special guest tonight before team has one last pitch for you. It will be a man who has bane, bent the mind upside down, inside and out, and came back with a unique formula for shape. I'm not, I'm not telling, I'm not, I do not mean the shape like Instagram fit, like fitness shape or something like this. No, I mean the real shape. Well, this man doesn't yet have his own monument of him, but the shape does. The shape he has invented has, his, uh, has its own monument. So without any further delay, I present to you Minister Janusz Kapusta, the man who invested a new wheel, sort of, well, he reinvented the shape. Mr. Janusz Kapusta. Hello, sir. The floor is yours. <clears throat> oh. Ja w języku premiera Morawieckiego Państwu opowiem, żeby szybciej, bo mamy presję. Od, odkryłem nowy kształt i spróbuję go szybko w wielu obrazach pokazać. Po skończeniu architektury na Politechnice Warszawskiej jeździłem na zajęcia historii i filozofii i zadałem pytanie, jak narysować nieskończoność. Z tego wyniknął rysunek. Narysowałem taki korytarz wchodzący w kartkę, ale jak wiecie, nieskończoność jest plus minus. W związku z tym, jeżeli to jest plus, gdzie jest minus? Jeżeli minus, gdzie jest plus? To jest perspektywa, która się zbiega na horyzoncie. W związku z tym symetrycznie odwróciłem o 180 stopni. To jest zabieg dość geometryczny i też to pokolorowałem. W związku z tym miałem jakby korytarz wchodzący w kartkę i jakby z niego wychodzący. I to jest pierwsza sensacja, którą Państwo dziś oglądają, że nieskończoność ta, która biegnie w korytarz, jest naszą nieskończonością, którą ciągle spotykamy. Natomiast to poniżej my patrzymy na nieskończoność. Czy Państwo kiedy Kiedyś mieli okazję coś takiego zobaczyć. W każdym bądź razie w, w 1981 roku pojechałem do Stanów Zjednoczonych i y, tam przydarzyło się wiele różnych przypadków, ale tu biegnijmy, że y, wydrukowano mi tysiąc niepotrzebnych rzeczy i zobaczyłem, że można te, po linii, te linie horyzontu wyciąć i powstaje kwadrat. Kwadraty mają to do siebie, że można je składać ze sobą i w związku z tym y, z tego kształtu, jak widzicie, 
się pojawił się Keydron. To jest 11 stycznia w 1905 roku odkryłem nowy kształt, który tak wyglądał. To widzicie, że że tam jest wejście w kartkę, a to jest wyjście z kartki. Kejdron ma 11 ścian, stąd jego nazwa, bo 11 literą jest K, a Hydron jest od ścian. Kejdron brzmiało krócej. To była taka dziwna sensacja, ponieważ dwa Kejdrony, które mają pozytyw i negatyw, są bardzo seksualne, jak zaraz zobaczycie, i się dopełniają. Yin and Yang, to jest taki trójwymiarowy Yin and Yang, który ginie i powstaje sześcian. I to jest trochę mylące. To jest pierwsza sensacja, którą mia, mia, miałem, że ułożone płytki z ty, tych kejdronów, to jest e, pokaz, jak światło przechodzi, co się dzieje ze ścianą. E, jeżeli e, jest w ogóle niezrozumiałe, jak ten kształt wygląda. E, idźmy dalej. Je, jeżeli się odkryje nowy kształt, są cztery drogi opowiadania o nim. To jest nauka, sztuka, zastosowania i znaczenie sym, symbo, symboliczne. To jest parę, dwie najważniejsze rzeczy, które mam do powiedzenia. Reszta jest jakby obrazami. Zajęło mi, mówiłem, że odkryłem nowy kształt. Pan powiedział, że ja wynalazłem kształt. To jest jakby dłuższa opowieść, a szkoda nam czasu. Natomiast odkryłem nowy kształt. Zajęło mi 8 lat, żeby znaleźć, gdzie jest w kosmosie. Dlaczego Kolumb odkrył Amerykę? Bo Ameryka była. W związku z tym, że jej odkrywa się, gdzie to było. 8 lat i... Przepraszam... Ruszy? Po, powinien, ok. To jest sześcian, który wszyscy znają, łącznie z matematykami. I w XIX wieku Szlafli, taki szwajcarski matematyk, postanowił zbadać, co wyniknie, jeżeli się sześcian podzieli wszystkimi płaszczyznami przechodzącymi przez osie symetrii, czyli podzielimy ten sześcian na wszystkie możliwe połowy. To, to już dziwne, że w XIX wieku dopiero kogoś to zainteresowało, ale no to nie ma znaczenia. Ile przekątnych ma kwadrat? Dwie, nie ma trzy, nie ma ileś. Tak samo po takim podziale wyniknie, zobaczycie to za chwilę, że sześcian zostanie podzielony na 48 ostrosłupów, które wszystkie spotkają się ostrzami w środku. To jak wybuch taki kosmiczny prawie, że wyniknie ze środka. Teraz on się pojawi i yy, tu nie ma kejdronu, nie ma go nawet jak zmieścić. Natomiast jeżeli się wie, wiemy, że sześciany można ze sobą zestawiać i tu yy, cztery złożone są i każdy z nich ma tę ten, ten samą jakość, no bo to jest istota tego, yy, tego podziału i nagle okazuje się, że pomiędzy nie udaje się wpisać kejdron. Ale co robił, już to wcześniej Państwo widzieli przy tym Inen Yang, że dwa kejdrony tworzą co? Sześcian. Ale to jest inny sześcian niż ten, od którego zaczęliśmy. To było najbardziej sensacyjne, jak ja byłem na konferencjach matematycznych w Ameryce, pokazując to i mówiąc, że y, mamy dwa sześciany. Normalnie no, każdy z nas wie i nie jest taki głupi, że jest jeden sześcian. Jest jeden, jeżeli nie myślimy. Jeżeli myślimy, są dwa. Jeden szlaflego, a drugi przesunięty o pół w bok i pół w dół, y, nazwałem go siatką kejdronową. Zajęło mi 13 lat, żeby spotkać mądrego matematyka. Matematycy są tak samo głupi, jak w każdym innym zawodzie, ale ciężko to z, 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 złapać, jeżeli się nie zna języka. W każdym bądź razie Okazało się, że Stanisław Kwapień odkrył, że równanie drga, czasoprzestrzenny model równania drgającej struny w czasie, widzicie, że strunę podciągnęliśmy do góry i ona w czasie, była w którymś momencie będzie prosta i odegnie się do dołu, tworzy powierzchnię kejdronu, czyli można powiedzieć, że co to jest kejdron, to jest każdy prostopadłościan przecięty równaniem drgającej struny, oczywiście opisując boki jeden przez czas, drugi przez siłę, trzeci przez strunę. 11 ścian, które sprawiło, że się nazywa kejdron. Way of art, to jest... Ja nazwałem między nauką a sztuką. Zadaję czasami pytanie, czy, dlaczego Picasso był ważnym artystą. Nie myślcie, pomyślicie w domu, ja wam powiem. Picasso jest ważnym artystą, bo nie ściągnął Picasso od nikogo, tylko odkrył go w sobie. Dlaczego Chagall jest ważnym artystą? No bo nie mówi, umie malować zaraz po drobie kogoś. Nie, odkrył go w sobie. Ważny artysta to jest człowiek, który wzbogacił nas wszystkich o siebie. Z tego punktu widzenia, jak mówię, o nikt w ogóle Kejdronie nie wiedział, ponieważ jako, jak powiedziałem, artysta yy, poświęcam mu życie trochę. To jest parę obrazków, czyli przelecimy, żeby ściany, które pokazują różne rzeczy. To jest jakby intrygująca rzecz, ponieważ 
Jak wiecie, te, już widzieliście, że dwa kejdrony dopełniają się do sześcianu. Znaczy różne są możliwości, natomiast tu zatańczą takie tango i się przybliżą do siebie i utworzą wzór. I okazuje się, że te cztery białe i cztery czarne tworzą na powierzchni siebie 38 416 kombinacji. Czyli gdybyście codziennie zmieniali jedną, to musicie żyć 105 lat, żeby sprawdzić, czy was oszukałem. To jest na wystawie w Warszawie, pokazałem je wszystkie. To, że Kejdon można rozciągać w każdą stronę, to jakby takie parę prac, żeby tak rzucić tylko. W Nowym Jorku układałem je, to jeszcze świętej pamięci wieżę, jak widzicie po prawej stronie. Na Polaski Day Parade zrobiliśmy Kejdon, który przejechał przez miasto i wszyscy się dziwowali, o co tym Polakom chodzi, co, to, co oni tak kombinują. To różne skale, zrobiłem teatr dla dzieci w Katowicach i tam jest najwięcej w tej chwili młodych ludzi, którzy wiedzą, co to jest Kejdron. To jest ostatnia rzeźba, która w Elblągu, to jeszcze poprzedni minister zaproponował. To jest wystaw, to jest właśnie ten pomnik w kole, który starosta, jak się dowiedział, że urodziłem się w powiecie koło, wybudował pomnik. Ostatnio właśnie zapraszam dyrektor Muzeum Narodowego, profesor Jerzy Miziołek jest na sali. On oglądał mój pokaz i powiedział, w tym roku jest 500 lat od śmierci śmierci najwybitniejszego człowieka, który kombinował, czyli Leonarda da Vinci i zaprosił mnie, żeby złożyć mu tribut, czy hołd. No i y, możecie zobaczyć, na, y, jest 22 metry na 3 na 3 taka instalacja. Wszyscy się pytają, no ale co z tego można robić? No co można z Kejdronu zrobić? Nic, tak jak ze Szewścianu. Co można ze Szewścianu zrobić? Dopóki nie wymyślimy, co można zrobić, to jest kształt. Ja pokazuję, na początku wymyśliłem 168 zastosowań i sam się uspokoiłem. Udało mi się do, wprowadzić do masowej produkcji właściwie cztery. Jeden to jest concrete block, czyli pustak. Mój kolega Czeczot, taki dowcipny grafik, mówił, że powinien się nazywać Kapustak. I to jest pierwszy budynek w 1995 roku, który w Hollywood został wybudowany w Los Angeles. To jest jakby taka ciekawostka, tylko pokażę. Początek to jest do zobaczenia na YouTube nawet, ale jak się zmienia ta płytka, czy, czy ten pustak w, w ścianie, na ścianie kiedy jest. To jest ten, ten sam y, kształt, który jest łatwy w transporcie, ponieważ jeden wchodzi w drugi. Zobaczcie, jak się zmienia, kiedy prze, światło przechodzi. I to jest jakby tylko, to, to pokażę, to, to jest ten sam kształt, który w różnych konfiguracjach, w, przy różnych światłach się zmienia i różne rzeczy. Ale mówię, to jest do, do zobaczenia, ale idźmy dalej. To jest jakby ciekawostka. To jest taki program amerykański 2020 z, y, o, przepraszam, z Barbarą Walters. Ale tu jest muzyka do tego, czy nie? O, poproszę. Now Christina Aguilera. O, Christina Aguilera, taka piosenkarka amerykańska, jak znacie. Tu jak ona się pokaże. But just as she reached the top, the woman who could do this. Jak ona miała 19 lat, szukano najtańszego studia nagraniowego w Las Vegas i najtańsze okazało się zbudowane z pustaków kejdronowych, ponieważ one rozpraszają dźwięk, jak w każdym studio. Nagra swoją pierwszą płytę i sprzedała 12 milionów kopii i tak się zaczęła jej kariera, co tu widać. Glob, to jest... Kejdron umożliwia nowe odwzorowanie Ziemi. To jest taki most pomiędzy mapą trochę a niebem. Mówię tylko z Polski, może ktoś się odważać, że anusz Ziemia wygląda inaczej. To jest... Nie można na globusie porównać Meksyku i Turcji, bo są po drugich stronach. Można na mapie, co tu się wydarzyło, ale teraz widzimy północne odwzorowanie nieba. Jak przełożę w tę stronę, to pierwszy raz w życiu możecie Państwo zobaczyć, gdzie leży Madagaskar naprzeciw Nowej Zelandii, Argentyny i Australii. Natomiast jak się przekręci na drugą stronę, to jest północne odzorowanie globu z Krzyżem Południa, tutaj na dole. Natomiast jak się złączy tymi stronami, to jest północne, czyli co się kręci dookoła nas z gwiazdą polarną na środku. Thank you and good night. Okay. 
Gra, to jest po prostu te cztery białe i cztery czarne kejdrony umożliwiają te 38 tysięcy kombinacji. Tu nie będę też się rozwijał, cały alfabet można zrobić i dużo innych ciekawych rzeczy. Butelka to jest jakby najbardziej, jakby się ktoś zapytał przyszłość, to że można się będzie z czegoś napić z tego kejdronu. To jest kolorowa budka, to mój kolega chce sprowadzać z Polski. To jest dla, z Paradyżem zrobiliśmy taki projekt, że y, ponieważ ten Kejdron się obraca i ma sześć ścian, w związku z tym y, y, te cztery białe, cztery czarne po, pozwalają na odtworzenie każdego y, kształtu. Okay. Czas. Ty, tu tylko przelecę, to jest jakby różne y, opcje od mebli, po, ponieważ mówię, no, wszystko można zrobić, skoro można zrobić. Tu nawet taki profesor Cywiński wy, wymyślił głośniki, w Poznaniu zrobiliśmy dużą strukturę, to jest na w Zielonej Górze na festiwalu. Krowę robiłem też z logiem państwa tu przed chwilą. To jest, na, to jest z Muzeum Seksu w, w Nowym Jorku. Dwie pierwsze czekolady, jakie zostały zrobione, ponieważ jedna wchodzi w drugą. I to jest inspiracje, czyli krzesło, które ktoś w Gdańsku zrobił w, w Katowicach, Górki Wielkie. Tak tylko przelecę, bo już te filozofii... To można, ja, troszkę nie wyczyściliśmy tego, ale tu jest tylko tak, na, na, nic, nie ma znaczenia. To jest pół, bo, bo czas już przekroczyłem chyba, tak? Czy mówię, bo to, no ale sami państwo widzą, że, że przepraszam, prawda? Pomarańczowy to jest sześcian szlaflego, a niebieski jest kejdronowy. Kejdron został przez Morawieckiego wybrany na logo Polski Innowacyjnej. W Niemczech jeszcze by było cała, całe stoisko, 1200 metrów, można zobaczyć w Ministerstwie Rozwoju. Ceramika Paradyż to nawet inside, outside. To przelecimy, to już jest koniec. Można zrobić taką piramidę schodkową. Jeżeli usiądziemy na górze, to każdy patrzy w swoją stronę i może nie zauważyć siebie. Jak usiądziemy tutaj, to będziemy razem. Ja Państwu dziękuję za pobyt razem a teraz możecie pójść na górę i patrzeć sobie, gdzie chcecie. Well, I promised you mind blowing, right? That was it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for Janusz Kapusta, the man who invented K-Drone, and Christina Aguilera, obviously. Thank you, sir. All right. No monkey business. Uh, let's get back to the uh, track. Ladies and gentlemen, now for you, the long-awaited, our guest, but before he enters the stage, some bullet points about him. He's a precursor of co-working industry and the creator of the biggest campus for tech companies in the world, located near the MIT in USA. He is the founder and global CEO of Cambridge Innovation Center. He is the founder of the Venture Cafe Foundation Network. He's the president of Lab Central and Mass Robotics, MIT Sloan School of Management lecturer, and the, as I said, receiver of the uh, title of Entrepreneur of the Year 2014. Uh, we spoke earlier about hope. Hope is written all over the walls of the CIC Institute with the words, with the phrase, we seek to fix the world by creating powerful, innovational communities. So ladies and gentlemen, buckle up and get ready to take part in a takeaway from Hunt, from the first and one and the only startup matchmaker, Mr. Tim Rowe. Thank you, Max. Hello, team. The floor is yours. Thank you all for having me here today. I'm going to talk about innovation. First of all, I want to thank the Polish National Federation, uh, PFN, for organizing the event. Uh, this is an incredible opportunity for Poland to look forward into the future. Uh, I also want to thank uh, my fellow presenters today, the entrepreneurs who shared a whole large number of wonderful ideas and new companies and initiatives that are going on here in Poland. The word innovation is a little bit overused. It might sound a little boring at this point. You hear it all the time. So I want to start by just saying, you know, what do we mean by innovation? 
And specifically, this is my definition. So, innovation is often confused with invention. Invention is coming up with a cool new idea. Innovation is something a little different. So let me start with invention. This is an invention. It really works. This is a bicycle that you can ride on water. It was invented in the Netherlands about 100 years ago. Uh, it does get your pants a little wet, I think. Um, and it was never widely adopted by society. This is what we think of as just an idea. It's a good idea, but it's just an idea. So innovation is taking an idea and making it useful for society. When a large number of people actually use it in some way to make the world better, we, we tend to call that an innovation. It's taking an idea all the way through the process until it's widely used. In fact, the electric car was not new. This was not, Elon Musk did not invent electric cars. They had been, been built 100 years earlier. Uh, but what he did was he pulled all the pieces together, including the electric car charging infrastructure. He found a way to really make it work, and now millions of people drive electric cars and produce less emissions, less global warming gases. So this is what we mean by innovation, just as a, a, a starting point for this conversation. Why would we care? What was, what's important about innovation that means that all of you got out of your homes and came here today to listen to somebody talk about innovation ecosystems? I want to start and talk about that just a little bit before we get into how innovation ecosystems work. So the first reason we should care, and I think we all know this, is that these innovations solve problems. We could all list some really big problems facing the world today. We know, for instance, that our technology is heating up the planet, and if we heat up the planet too much, really bad things happen. We think that we will heat up the planet at least two degrees, maybe three or four degrees Fahrenheit. Excuse me, I'm not a Celsius guy yet. And if we go over about two degrees, really bad things start to happen to the planet. The, wor the planet's water supply, for instance, uh, is significantly reduced. So, innovation is the way we address these problems. It's also how we get clean water to people, how we get enough food to people, how we get enough energy to live. All of these are addressed by innovation, so that's an easy one. There's a second reason, though, we should care about innovation, and that is that this is how we all have healthy economies. This is how we make money, how we have jobs, and how we live well. Today, innovation is not spread equally throughout the world. There are some places that have a lot of innovation and some places that don't have innovation. I'm just going to explain this chart for a moment so you understand what this says. This is the United States economy for the last 40 years or so. And what you see in the white is new jobs created by new companies. So companies that are five years old or younger, that's basically startups, are creating about three million jobs every year in the United States. The, the jobs in, red, in orange here, those are the jobs that are created by large businesses or destroyed by large businesses. And what we see is that on average, every year in the United States, large companies destroy about a million, jo uh, excuse me, about a million jobs a year. So what we're finding is that, excuse me, that large businesses are slowly dying and being replaced by new businesses. So if you think about it this way, older companies, like car companies in the United States that have been around for many, many years, for decades, some of those are having trouble now, and they're getting smaller. And new companies, like Tesla, in my earlier example, are getting larger. That's a natural process that's pr produced by innovation. But when innovation only happens in some places in the world and not others, that means that the prosperity, the wealth, the money, tends to go to some places in the world and not to others. So it's a pretty important question for each part of the world, and I think we're here in Poland talking about it now. How do we make sure that, for instance, Poland continues to produce a large amount of innovation so that as the old jobs go away, Poland has new jobs as a healthy economy? Without this, I think a lot of your, your most talented Poles will go to other parts of the world to find jobs. And this, this brain drain you see from Poland will continue if the good jobs are produced somewhere else and not in Poland. So that's why it's important for us to talk about how do we make innovation work better, not just in general, but specifically here in Poland. 
So, uh, in our work for the last 20 years or so, we have been building what's called an innovation ecosystem. Um, that is a specific social process, if you will, a, a set of collaborations between universities, scientists, entrepreneurs, investors, and government. In my case, in the Massachusetts area. That's around Boston and Cambridge, Massachusetts, where Harvard and MIT and others are. I'm here to share some of the learnings that we have from that area to see what is translatable or what is usable here in Poland. Okay, so to understand that, let's start, let's take a step backwards and look at the history of innovation, how, how we used to innovate and how we're innovating today. So 100 years ago, 200, 300, 400 years ago, innovation was mostly done in isolation. You had scientists, wealthy people who were interested in science in their homes, doing experiments. Maybe they had a kite that they, they put up in the, in the sky and, a, and lightning struck it and they learned about electricity. That was kind of the world of innovation two, three, four, five hundred 500 years ago. This picture is Nikola Tesla's laboratory. Te this Tesla, the older Tesla, was one of the great inventors in America, credited with a microwave, neon lights, many different kinds of inventions. But he hid himself in the mountains so nobody could see his inventions. He really wanted his inventions to be his, to be secret, and he made sure nobody could learn about them. This isn't really happening anymore. Soon after this, we started to move what we called to the garage era of innovation. Walt Disney, I'm sure every one of you has seen a Disney movie, he started in his garage where he parked his car next to his house. And you can see some little Mickey and Minnie figures there where he painted them by hand. That's how that business began. This was where the computer company Hewlett and Packard was founded in a garage. This was Steve Jobs' garage, and I think in this speaker series, his good friend Steve Wozniak is coming to this stage to speak with you, which is really exciting. I'm so excited to be on the same stage as, as he was. They started in their garage. That was an era of innovation, if you will. This isn't how it's happening now today, though. What you're seeing is innovators are coming together into concentrated areas. They're sharing the same facilities. They're, you have hundreds of companies in a building, if you will. And one of the reasons is that the speed of science is faster now. You don't need to, me to explain this to you, but it may, be, it may have been 100 years between major inventions a few hundred years ago. Now it's maybe a year between major in inventions. How many of you hold, have a, cell, a smartphone? If you raise your hand if you have a smartphone. Okay, I'm looking for any of you who don't, and of course there's nobody. But the smartphone was only invented, the first smartphone was released in 2007. So we're, we're only about a decade, if you will, from this technology being first released to everyone pretty much in the, in the developed world having one. Um, that's how fast innovation is, is, is changing. It's changing even faster in areas such as genetic engineering. What they're doing today in genetic engineering is completely mind-blowing. But if you want to be an inv innovator in genetic engineering, you need to be near other genetic engineers because that field is moving so fast that if you are back in Tesla's laboratory in the mountains, you're never going to be able to follow what's going on in that, in that field. That's true with pretty much all modern innovation. So in these concentrated facilities, and we have these in, in the Boston area, I'll tell you more, you have people teaching each other. People like me are getting up on the stage and they're saying, this is how I went and found venture capital. This is how I sold my first products. Uh, these are the people that helped me build the company. All of that learning is now taking place in these what we call innovation hubs. That's part of what we call an innovation ecosystem. That's where you'll find mentors, people who have innovated before, similar to you, who can say, hey, this is a great idea, I've seen something like that before, and here are a couple things you might want to think about doing so that it really works. So what do we do, or how do we change Poland so that we have more of this kind of innovation? If I've established that it's important, that we care about it because it solves the world's problems and because it keeps, us, keeps our economies healthy, if I've established that it's kind of a race, that some places like San Francisco and Boston are doing well, and other places need to make sure that they're doing just as well, producing just as much innovation. So what are the things that we can do? Okay, I'm gonna bring a little bit of science and data to the topic now, and hopefully some of this science will stick in your, in your brain and, and you can apply it going forward. So the first thing that we know now is 
some really, really informa interesting information about how people work together when they're close together. This is a study done at Bell Laboratories, one of the famous homes of innovation in the United States. And what they did was they looked at all the scientists in many buildings in Bell Laboratories. It was a big campus. And they said, what is the one factor that causes two scientists to decide to work together and collaborate and produce something new, some kind of new technology? They had a lot of data, because when a scientist had to do a project, they filled out forms. They went through all the forms and analyzed it. And they found that there was simply one factor that caused most of the, most of the collaboration, most of people working together. And that factor was just how far away they were physically from each other. So what they found, for instance, is that two scientists who were on the same corridor of the same floor of the same building, about 10% of the time they would become close enough, they would trust each other enough to do a project together. If you were on opposite corridors of the same floor, it would only happen about 2% of the time. And if you were on different floors, it only happened about 0.3% of the time. So essentially, if you're on a different floor from someone in a building, you're not going to know them very well. You're not going to know what they're working on. You're not going to get friendly with them, and you're not going to do anything with them. Ahmed here is somebody I met last night at a gathering in, in Warsaw called Venture Cafe. Didn't know each other. We talked for a while, and I became impressed with the things he knew. I suspect that we will continue to talk in the future. We have a connection now. That comes from face-to-face -face interaction. OK, so the first key to producing more innovation is getting more collaboration to happen. And that, it turns out, is very simple. You have to get the people who have the potential to collaborate, who have ideas, who have money, who have talent. You have to get those people together physically, kind of compact them, if you will, into a dense space. This is not really a new idea. This is a little bit like what a university is. If you think about it, universities concentrate professors and students and learning and libraries, and there's a lot of learning that goes on. Take that same idea and just apply it to the business world, and what you'll see is a lot more cool innovations. The same thing is happening in Boston and in San Francisco. If you walk around the streets, many of you have probably been there, you can't go into a cafe without running into an entrepreneur or an investor or hearing ideas. That's an innovation ecosystem. OK, so knowing this, what do you do? You can build what we call innovation infrastructure. I'll give you an example of this. About four years ago, we built a laboratory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. To our knowledge, this is the first large shared wet laboratory in the world. A wet laboratory is where you do research on things like genetics, uh, drugs, the human body, this kind of very heavy biological research. But this was shared. So different entrepreneurs could come in, use the same equipment, run into each other uh, constantly, day by day. We had about 40 companies come in and use this shared wet laboratory. And in those four years, we've seen several billion dollars, with a B, billion dollars of investment into these companies. We've seen multiple IPOs, public offerings. And now, by our calculation, about 10% of all investment at the first round that is Series A, if you know what I'm talking about, uh, for life sciences in the entire United States takes place in this one laboratory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So about one-tenth of all life sciences investment kind of moved to this shared wet laboratory. That's an example of innovation infrastructure uh, that we built, and it works. So these are some of the basics, if you will, about how you build a stronger innovation community. You bring people together. You build infrastructure, like laboratories, that they can use together. And as a result, you get a far greater amount of innovation pouring out. There is a formula. I'm going to wrap up in a couple of slides. The formula is to bring together the people with money, the people with ideas, and the people with talent. Concentrate them together. If you want to remember that, uh, MIT is the initials, which is also the initials of the school I went to. If you do it right, you get kind of a, what we call an innovation campus. You get all of these different pieces, uh, different uh, startup in, uh, accelerator type progress, uh, programs, and laboratories, and investors, and entrepreneur spaces, and so forth. You get all these things close to each other, and you will get the kind of alchemy, if you will, the mixing of all these factors that leads to more innovation. Uh, I'll close on this. I'm going to skip the, there's a little Kendall Square uh, story I will skip. Actually, no. I'm going over time, but I'll just do this one slide, if that's all right. So 
Uh, this was, we think, the first concentrated innovation hub in the world. And it's a fun story, so I'd like to relate it. Uh, this building here in the middle was roughly where our city hall is in Boston. And you see the date at the bottom is 1879. On the ground floor was a guy who sold electronics parts. Uh, it was kind of, I don't know the equivalent in Poland, but in America we have something called Radio Shack, where you could go and get batteries and wires if you're kind of an inventor type. They were all around the country. He was probably the first one of those in the country. And uh, inventors started to move into the building. So the guy on the left is Alexander Graham Bell. And the, um, uh, the guy on the right is Thomas Edison. So Bell, you may know, is credited with inventing the telephone. And Edison, you may know, is credited with inventing the light bulb. But what people don't know is that these people worked in the same building at the same time. They actually hired the same guy, the, the guy in the middle there, uh, Louis Latimer, to the same person did the drawings for their patents. So these guys actually were supposed, the people say that they hated each other, but they shared resources. They were actually in the same building, they were learning, they were trying to compete with each other, and out of that came the telephone and the light bulb. The story is a little more complicated than that, but that's the basics of it, and I think it gives you an idea of what I'm talking about in terms of concentrate your thinkers, uh, and a lot of wonderful things will come out of it. So the final slide I wanted to share is this one. This is a map of Warsaw. I think we're talking about innovation in all of Poland, and you have a number of really wonderful innovation cities in Poland beyond Warsaw. But if you just look at Warsaw, this is the universities, the startups, the investors, the accelerators. You have an enormous amount of innovation going on around Warsaw. I think actually the one thing that you don't have right now in Warsaw is you haven't yet figured out how to bring it together and concentrate it. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tim Rowe has uh, spoken about some very exciting and interesting um, ideas. He will be joining us shortly, just after uh, we can find some people to, you know, bring furniture to the stage, please. Thank you. Come on in, please, cordially, I invite you. Thank you. So, um, one thing uh, and uh, another thought I had while listening, listening to Mr. Tim was that um, I think he's a bit of an Einstein sidekick because uh, in this theory, uh, when you give uh, startups a proper space, a physical space and time, they breed the innovation. And this will be the first question that Tim will gonna answer, at least I hope so. Tim, please come back to us on the stage. Thank you, great show. Please sit down. It's good to have you here. Thank you, um, it's good to be here. So, how do you feel, how do you feel like uh, as a uh, Einstein sidekick, you know? I don't know if you've heard this uh, part about the space and time, but basically the thought is that uh, you're saying that giving the startups the same space, physical space and time, they breed innovation. How does that work? I think it happens naturally. Uh, so, uh, probably all of you know your neighbors. You know the people who live one door over or another apartment in your same building. Uh, oftentimes, we help our neighbors. Someone knocks on the door and says, I can, can I borrow an egg? Um, that's a, I think that's a universal human experience. Uh, when you're close with other innovators, the same things happen, except instead of saying, hey, can I borrow an egg? Somebody says, do you know a good lawyer? Because I need to write a non-disclosure agreement. Well, usually when somebody asks me, do you know a good lawyer? I know he's in trouble. So <laughs> Do you have a lot of friends like that, Max? Uh, not lately. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the thing is, uh, I get that um, this feeling of cooperation, it, uh, it is quite a thing for me that uh, uh, you might refer to Amish's, right? Amish, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Because uh, we've seen the movies, the situation that uh, if somebody wants to 
raise a barn, well, mm -hmm. basically, he can't do it's a great it example. By, him, by himself, right? Actually, in my, in my talk, I used to have a picture of the Amish raising a barn, so that's, a, that's, that's very thoughtful of you. Yeah, in fact, that's, that's what people used to do, not just the Amish, but many rural communities in the United States. Uh, when, let's say, maybe a barn burned down, somebody lost their barn, that farmer would not be able to keep their livestock, store their crops, it would be terrible. And that farmer alone might not be able to build a barn in one season. Their family might die. But if everyone in the community came together and built the farm together, they could do it in a day. And that's indeed ex exactly what happened in the United States uh, in our rural history. Uh, I think this is something like that, but a little different. Uh, what we found is that the kinds of help that people need is simpler than that. So I heard some really cool ideas and businesses, not just ideas, presented here earlier. Uh, you take, for instance, uh, this notion of a network of satellites around the world. I was thinking, well, uh, would the investors at Boeing, for instance, be interested in that? Do they, know, do they know each other? Is that an introduction I should make? Those kinds of, maybe just an email, maybe just a suggestion, could mean the difference between a good technology failing and becoming a worldwide success. Well, the thing for collaboration is, um, well, you have the same space, you have different companies, different startups, and basically uh, everybody plays to win his own game, right? They're competitors. Mm. How come they overcome that and help each other? So I think this is what we've learned is the impact of this proximity. Uh, when you don't know someone, you're right. When they're kind of distant, you're like, ah, why do I care what he or she does or doesn't do. You're my do. competition, why should yeah. I help you? Oftentimes these days you're not so much competition because it's not that common, two people are doing exactly the same thing. It's just that you're busy and you don't know them. Um, but think back to the friends you had in university. If those friends call and they say, hey, will you help me? You probably go way out of your way to help them. Um, you probably spent... No declarations now there. Okay, well, Max may be a little different. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would. <laughs> the, I just don't want to admit it. You typically spend about four years in university, right? And during those four years, at least that's the United States. In yeah, those okay, four five. years, you get you get to be very close, very friendly with five a set of Poland people. Five in Poland or eleven, it depends. <laughs> Depending on uh, which degree you go for. So in in our innovation center, Cambridge Innovation Center in Cambridge, Mass, we now have an the average amount of time that people are there is about five years. So just a little longer than a university. And what happens is they're building real deep friendships with these other uh, startup builders. Uh, but instead of being kind of random other students, they're also entrepreneurs. They're also working perhaps in a similar field like life sciences. And so the things that you can do to, to make a change are dramatic. Right. Tim, uh, the thing I want to ask you uh, from this totally different field, um, because, okay, this is a quite cool observation that we live in the digital world and yet the physical closeness helps to get connected. And that's great. But is it the way you are trying to do right here in Warsaw? Let us hear more about it. Yes, actually we are. Um, so um, we have this view that, uh, as I mentioned, that there's a tremendous amount of, of innovation talent in Warsaw. Um, but that it's not very well connected, that people are not plugged in. And I would say this is similar in other cities as well, not just in Warsaw. So uh, we had this problem in Cambridge, where I'm from, and we had a really simple idea. We said, okay, how about one, one day a week, uh, we pick Thursdays uh, in the evening, uh, I'll buy some beer and I'll just share it with all the innovators in town. Uh, so I went and bought a keg of beer and we put up a sign, okay, we're going to get the innovators together and it's free beer. And uh, the first night sort of 20 people came and then 30 people came and then 50 people came and now we get about 500 people each week coming to this gathering in Cambridge. Uh, we started, said, well, maybe we could do this in another city. So we, we, for various reasons, we went to St. Louis, Missouri, which is where our agriculture technology is in the United States. And we tried the same thing, bought some beer, called the innovators, said every Thursday. Beer and brings innovation. Beer works, turns out. And uh, we have about 600 people every week coming together, 600 innovators coming every week in St. Louis, which is actually kind of a small town, smaller than Warsaw. Um, so uh, we've started doing this around the world. 
Uh, we now have more people coming to this event every year than the biggest tech conference. If you know the South by Southwest Tech Conference, which is a wonderful conference, we actually have more people every year coming to our beer gatherings. Uh, and we're in, we're in Tokyo, we're in a number of places around the world. Just recently, we, we started doing the same thing here in, here in Warsaw. Um, and to begin with, we're doing it in Warsaw at once a month. I think it's the last Thursday um, of every month uh, from, what, 5 to 8 o'clock, something like that. Um, and, but Google Venture Cafe Warsaw, if you want to know. Uh, it's open if you're an innovator. It's not open to the, everyone. It's open to people who believe that they have something innovative to bring to the world. And um, in other countries and other cities, this has been very successful. Last night, we had over 200 people and only the second gathering here in uh, Poland. Okay. But beside that, mm, you're building the largest in this part of Europe innovating CIC campus. Yes. Um, so, uh, what I talked about earlier, this notion that innovation works better if you bring people close together, is something that we didn't know starting out. We were actually just a bunch of friends from MIT, where I went to school, and we all needed a place to work, and so we just rented a place and shared it. Um, then, you know, there were five companies of, run by friends, and then there were 10, and then there were 20, and then there were 50, and then there were 100, and then there were 200, and now we have, all told, about 2,000 companies. And they're in, in multiple buildings, and they're all kind of crammed together. Um, this uh, has created a kind of a magic. Um, I guess it's similar to the notion of having a university, except it's after the university. It's the kind of the innovation next chapter to a university. Uh, so that has worked really well. Um, we, as I said, we built them in a number of places around the world, and, and next year we will open one of those here in Warsaw. What I'm really interested in is uh, the answer to the question, why did you choose Poland? So uh, we started choosing Poland uh, not because we said, ah, we want an innovation campus, but we said, ah, we need the best place in the world to build a technology team. We decided software was important to our business. Uh, software coders are hard to find in Boston. And so we went around the world and we looked and said, where can we find the best talent at a reasonable price, who are loyal, who are serious, honest? And we really had a lot of options because we were looking at the whole world. We decided to come to Poland. We had no particular reason it had to be Poland. I'm not Polish. I just thought this is the place to do it. And so we have about a 10-person team that do our software development now here. And as we got to know Poland and Warsaw better, we said, well, we should do an innovation uh, a, a campus here, and so that's our next step. That's amazing. So, basically, um, the one thing was the, your real-time need, yeah. and that was the reason to choose Poland, but uh, you're a wise man, you have the perspective. So, beside that, uh, what perspectives you have, Poland has? Sure. Well, so I, I brought a lot of people now to Poland. Uh, when I come to Poland, I also bring other, others with me. And there's something about Poland which I think is, is unique and different. Uh, I've lived in a number of countries around the world. I speak a number of languages, Asian and European languages. And there's a, a kind of a deep seriousness in Poland. Actually, one other thing I didn't mention is, uh, for just completely randomly, three of our early employees at Cambridge Innovation Center are Polish. I don't mean Polish-Americans. I mean they're Polish. Two of them were married, and they got a green card lottery, and they came over. And, and uh, these, are, these are three of our best employees. Hardworking, they've risen in the organization. They're very, very capable. So I have this impression and please don't change my impression, Max. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> wouldn't. Uh... Poles are very serious, hardworking, loyal, uh, capable people. And uh, so what's not to like? Why not do business here in Poland? Yeah, that's it. Uh, for to every person that lives Poland and works abroad, I always say that, remember, you're the Polish ambassador. Now it doesn't matter what you do, right? I think that's, that's exactly right. And I, I have to tell you that your Polish ambassadors abroad are doing a really good job. All right, great, thank you. The next question is, can, in your opinion, Poland become the innovative hub, hub for Europe? I think it can. So, um, I don't know if you've checked recently, but a lot of Europe is not run that well. There's a lot of red tape, there's a lot, there's a lot of difficulty building businesses in many countries in Europe. I don't find that to be the case in Poland. Poland, to me, feels open for business. It feels easy to do business in. Uh, if I have one piece of advice for Poland, I would say keep it that way. Um, don't, don't let the uh, kind of um, 
desire to put too many rules, too many regulations in place uh, take over. Um, in Asia, there's a, as you, you well know, uh, there's a place called Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong was always kind of a freewheeling, open place. An enormous amount of business got done in Hong Kong and not in other countries because it was such an easy place to do business. I would say, you know, Singapore is another good example and maybe a better model for Poland. Both of them were the pirate Pirates, yes, I suppose yes. so. I, I suppose if we look Earlier. at the history of Poland, there might be a little bit of that too. Yeah, we weren't pirates, right? But uh, it's a good thing to hear that um, you see our market as not over-regulated. Um, still, uh, you might ask, um, if, uh, do you feel there are um, proper incentives to get the business, the innovating business, to Poland? Yeah, so um, we didn't come here with incentives. Uh, it, we are always happy to have incentives and we think those can be really effective. Uh, we came here because we think Poland is the right place to be. Um, there are probably things that Poland could do with, with public investment in innovation infrastructure that it can't do now. So I do think whether it's working with us or anyone else, uh, an example that I gave earlier was the shared wet laboratory. A shared wet laboratory is a really expensive thing to build. Uh, in Massachusetts, which is very successful, should not need incentives. Uh, it nevertheless invest, invested many millions of dollars in building a shared wet laboratory so that more life sciences startups could begin in Massachusetts. I think that same uh, approach to thinking about careful investments in building innovation infrastructure could be important for Poland. Okay. As I remember um, of uh, checking your other presentations, there was this um, observation, and it's, this is another um, interesting observation, that uh, when you give those startups the same space and time, physical space, the other wonderful things happen yeah. because they bring in the money. The yeah. venture capitals right. seem to like to surround those yes. hubs of startups, right? That's exactly right. So uh, actually one of the slides I skipped over, maybe I shouldn't have. I, I showed you uh, how an innovation hub works. Uh, in my example of Kendall Square, what happened was, Kendall Square is a neighborhood, if you will, in Cambridge, next to Boston on the East Coast, a little bit north of New York, for those of you who don't know that area. Kendall Square now has more Nobel laureates, Nobel Prize winners, than any other square mile on the planet. And I thought someone was clapping there for a minute. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, that's because of Harvard and MIT. So we have good universities and good talent. But we, didn't, we weren't the winners yet in innovation businesses. Uh, so much of that talent was leaving and going to other places, which is, I think, something that Poland relates to as well. Um, so what we found was that when we built this kind of hub for innovators and many startups moved together in Cambridge, I'm, and I'm talking hundreds and eventually 1,000 plus startups in one little area. Then the venture capital firms moved in. And we now have uh, over $8 billion of venture capital just in the buildings together with our startups and about twice that kind of in the nearby buildings around it. Uh, that's as much venture capital as most countries. Like uh, I think the UK is at a similar level as this little neighborhood in Cambridge. Yeah, so if you do build a, a, a successful concentration of innovation, it's a way of kind of getting the moths or like the, the venture capital, the moths will be attracted to the candlelight. To the light. Yes. Okay, and that's the thing you're trying to do with the space in Warsaw. That's correct. All right, great. Um, so I have to ask you this question. Sure. Uh, after, because I really hope that uh, you, you will have a great time tonight and you're uh, in, in Poland and afterwards you, if you would be so kind, would become the ambassador of Poland of on the worldwide arena. Would you say uh, later on that the Polish, uh, the Poland is a place worth investing in? Well, we are investing heavily in it, so I hope so. Um, you ask me again in two or three years, uh, but we're investing many millions of dollars of our own money uh, that we're bringing to Poland to build this uh, infrastructure, and um, we think that it's a, it's a good choice. Great to hear it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's the time for some quick, quick uh, Q&A sessions. So if you have questions, just free, feel free to ask them. Please. Can we have a microphone, please? Thank you. 
Hello, uh, Alex Grant, Vital Voices. It was a women empowerment organization from DC. Um, I, I loved everything you said about Poland. There's one thing we're struggling with, and it's the issue of trust. Mm -hmm. You know, for collaboration to happen, for innovation to happen, people need to trust each other. And we seem not to have progressed in the last 30 years with the level of trust in the society. Is there a recipe? I don't mean a quick recipe necessarily, but what's the recipe for this society to develop that, to enable the, that great innovation to happen? I, I feel almost like someone asked you to ask this question because it's a perfect question, so thank you. Um, okay, so there is a academic model for trust uh, that's out there. Uh, none of these models are perfect, but I, I like it. It says that trust is based on, has three components, okay? Uh, it's, it's based on the notion, trusting someone is based on the notion that you believe they're competent. So the first piece is competence. The second piece is that you believe they're benevolent, that, they are, that they are positive, that they, they mean well towards you. And the third is that they have integrity. And integrity means that people will do what they say they will do, okay? So competence, if I, my son is here somewhere in the back, Sam, hi. So if I lend Sam my car keys and he drives my car, I'd better hope he's competent, meaning he knows how to drive a car. That's one thing I mean when I say I trust him to borrow my car. Another is I better believe he's benevolent, that he's not gonna sell my car and take the money and go to Mexico, right? Um, the third is, and it's a little diff different than benevolence, is integrity. So if Sam says, I'm going to visit my friend's house, but we're not going to drink. Um, and then he goes to a party and he does drink. That would be a lack of integrity. Um, so I have to believe that he's got integrity, that he's benevolent, that he means well, um, and that he's competent, that he knows how to drive. It, it, the, the experts believe that the only way we can assess these three things in another person is through face-to-face -face contact. So I don't know you. But if we spend time uh, chatting for an hour at a venture cafe event, uh, as I did with, with Ahmad earlier, um, then we probably would start to know each other. I might say, let's have coffee, and you say, I have a business idea, and I might say, why don't you talk to my friend who's an investor, right? Trust is beginning to form. So we need to create opportunities for people who have potential to work with each other, because if you don't have potential, then it's a waste of your time. But people who have real potential to work, work with each other, they need to have opportunities to spend more time face to face. And that's really it. And our, our, our answer for doing that, I joked that it's free beer. Actually, free beer helps. Um, but the, the other thing we usually do is we try to bring sort of intellectual stimulating content which causes people to break the ice. So for instance, last night we had a panel about what's called the, the new lifestyle. And the new lifestyle could be anything you think that it means. It was a really interesting conversation. We had uh, five really wonderful Polish commentators on the, on the panel, plus myself. Actually, one of them, I think, was Indian. Um, and uh, we talked about what lifestyles are going to be like in the future. So that should have stimulated a conversation in the community so that after that talk, uh, Max, by the way, wasn't able to make it last night. He said he was preparing for this. I don't know if that's really true, but okay. And that's um, why you don't trust him. <laughs> that's right. Don't trust him yet. Um, so it's through those kinds of interactions that we, we build trust. Uh, and it's only face-to-face. -face, so the question is, how do you get more of this face-to-face -face interaction that can build trust? I hope that's helpful. Okay. We still have time for two more questions, please. In the second row. Hi, uh, Barbara Shvik. Uh, uh, I have one question uh, related to your investment. Uh, you mentioned that you're going to build a hub and yeah. you're going to bring all of those uh, innovators. I wonder whether you're interested in any particular industry or space or uh, market, or not market, uh, topic, or yeah. it's pretty much any invention that there can be. So uh, it's yes and. Uh, so uh, our centers, are, we target that about half of our center is any kind of innovation. And the reason is that there's a lot of innovation that doesn't fall neatly into a box yet, that nobody has ever, you know, doesn't even know that's a category. Um, and about half of it we hope to have focused on a few specific industries. 
Um, so our leader here, Orlea Skorsky, who said, if you want to wave, if you want to talk to him afterwards, he will give you, he's right here in the, in the front, he will give you uh, more of a sense. Uh, but we are, we're talking in depth with, with corporate sponsors and others, usually not just one, but several in an industry, about building hubs in Poland around industries where we think that Poland can win globally. Uh, a good example would be in banking. Uh, so, uh, so Poland is really innovative in its banking systems compared to other countries nearby. It already implements innovative technology that you don't see elsewhere. So it could be that that's a kind of innovation you'll see more of in Poland. You, you don't want to limit it to these, these few areas, as I said, because, uh, for instance, uh, some of the biggest innovations, uh, Skype, international phone calling, came out of Tallinn, Estonia, right? <laughs> Nobody would have said, okay, Talon, you are a capital of telecommunications, right? So you have to be both open to everything and try to support your winners. Okay, we have time for last question, please, sir. Hi, I'm Vikas, I'm Indian, and uh, I'm like you, one of the uh, foreigners who moved to Poland because I believed in the potential from Silicon Valley. So I'm glad, you know, you're, you're also joining that group of select few, and this is, this is part of my vision also to bring more foreigners um, in Poland, set up companies and become embedded into Poland, invested in Poland and you know, grow the business and uh, you know, exchange ideas and exchange networks. And I am working on a parallel initiative that I'll probably talk to you about and I've already told Aurelius, your teammate. So my question is when I, when I work with corporates, pitching them the idea that you, know, you work with startups about innovation, you know, to, so, so that you could innovate your companies. And you say, okay, we organize these events, we organize you know, mentoring sessions for the startups, 20 startups engaged, but what's the outcome? What's the net outcome? You know, at the end of the year, what do you want to see? How many pilots did you execute? How many new inventions? How many, uh, let's say, new technologies you scaled up in your companies? So talking about your initiative, okay, you know, you, you will set this up as a business, you will get clients probably, but do you have something of an outcome or a result at the end of three years, I want to see a unicorn coming out of Warsaw, or yeah. I want to see, you know, this life-changing innovation coming out of Warsaw. Do you have those outcomes, results, objectives in mind? Absolutely. So our mission at CIC, we, by the way, it's, it, it functions as a business, and it's a good business per se. That's because sharing is a really good business. If, uh, if I buy one table and use it myself, it costs me a table. If I buy a table and four of us share it, it costs me a quarter of a table. So sharing an innovation infrastructure, whether it's laboratories, robotics facilities, that's just good business. So that's the first piece. But it won't work if you don't have successful companies coming out. That just is a recipe for eventually going nowhere. So we do want to see large numbers of successful companies. Uh, when we went to St. Louis, which is, as I say, a smaller city in the United States, but with good universities, which is, uh, which is actually smaller than Warsaw, we saw in the couple of years after we got there about three times more venture capital investment. So we would like to see a significant increase in the dollars, or the loti, if you will, of venture capital investment here in Poland in local businesses. That would be a measure of the outcome. In practical terms, though, that means that uh, one or two or three or all of the companies that presented today, that they become very, very, very successful. Uh, if a company, a typical company, when they move into our innovation hubs, is usually about two people. Occasionally, we'll get five or 10, but usually it's two, maybe one. When they leave, they're typically 20 or 30 people. That's, that's an example of a company which is on a success path where the product is working, customers are buying it. That's what we're looking for. And so we're constantly asking ourselves, if that's not happening, we're saying, why isn't that happening? One possibility would be it's good technology, but the investors here are not ready for that kind of technology. So then we say, well, what can we do about that? Maybe we should invite them to come and pitch in Boston or in San Francisco. Maybe they'll find investors there. So we're, we're just trying to tinker with the model to figure out what can we do to make it work, applying our experience from the Boston market, which per capita I think is the highest venture capital investment uh, in the world. Okay, that's a sign. We are wrapping up the Q&A session. Thank you very much all for coming. Thank you, Tim. Um, it was fabulous Thank having you, you here. And if you may, the rest of you, this are startups, are on our guests, please join us on stage for a photo. Photo walk.
Thank you. Here, should we scoot over a little bit to make space for everyone? Well, please join us, you too, all of you. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Join us on the stage. Hey, CIC Let's team, share the I same think we're space. being come all on. invited up here. Why don't you Feel come on up? Feel cordially invited. We're all innovators. Is that what you're saying? We Bring everyone shy, here? You know, okay, so those of you who are shy, please stay in your seats. Right. Everyone else, come on up. Was it Alex? You asked a question, you have to come up. <laughs> How are you, I'm Tim. Nice to meet you. Feel free to join us. Yeah. Oh, you were there. Oh, I think I saw you in the audience. Yes. yes okay, all right. Whoops, I think we'll I'm talking. have you in front. Yes, yes, all right. I can hear myself also. Was it Alex? Yeah. Nice to meet you. Right. Hey, how are you? What's your name? Max. His name is Max. Did you get to know yeah. him? <laughs> oh, okay. I think that's about it. Thank you very okay. much. All right.